the presentation that I will give you today basically follows this outline. I will cover briefly on the Philippine context in relationship to agriculture and water resources. The opportunities that Mindanao offers. The methodological framework we apply for our work in Hiliban Foundation. The financial and economic analysis a few words on climate change and success factors of the foundation's work. And finally, very briefly, on our experience on the island of Mindanao. Many people ask me, what is the meaning of Hinduman Foundation, or Hinduman? It's actually pronounced Hinduman, L-U-P-A-N, but we write it. And each. It's a silent blue. It's an indigenous sacred book at Mount term. As it reads there. That partly explains the kind of work we do as well. It's kind of like the avatar. This graph shows basically poverty and hunger in the Philippines. We are now at about 18% hunger in the country. And if this trend continues with the population growth as it's going, that's we are, where we are today, more or less. And that's where we will be in just 10 years from now. 26% hunger growth. These were rice imports in 2008. We became the largest importer of rice in the world. And this trend is likely to continue, even though there are many different estimates floating around. Secretary Alcala has come out with a number of statements recently in the newspapers. You may have seen them. But chances are we will be importing a lot of rice in this we do something about water and agriculture. This is based on IFPRI's analysis. A growth rate of 2.75% in agriculture is not good enough. That will give us 132 million metric tons of food. We really need 150 metric million metric tons. We need to grow at 5% per annum. This graph is shared with me by former Secretary Sinan Balanda. There are many reasons for why agriculture is not growing fast enough. These have to do with agriculture policy. It has to do with NFA distribution networks. Governance and corruption issues. We heard the sauna of President Moynoy when he came into power. Land conversions to property, real estate. Not enough investment in infrastructure. Well, one other big reason is this. Three percent is in 2000, and this is more likely to be 1.5 to 2 percent primary forest cover today. I want to run you through something very basic, which you all know, but just as a refresher for us, why forests are important. Clouds are formed over warm oceans, and they are blown inland. They must strike a temperature differential of around 10 degrees, which the forest cover provides that cool air for condensation to up and rains to come down for irrigation and rain fed agriculture, for hydropower and for drinking water. If that forest is taken away, and that's what's been happening, 
blown away. Our reservoirs will be empty, our waters in the rivers will dry up, and we have salt water intrusion. Rodel can tell you a lot more about climate change and salt water intrusion than I can. Ondoy, Pepin, right in here, here in our backyard. This is Manila. On the one hand, we don't have enough water because the forests are gone. On the other hand, we have typhoons and cyclones coming. And forests that hold water are no longer there, and it comes right down. Gushes into our cities, our rural and urban centers. This is Pulangi. Seven million dollars scheme, clogged with silt, running at far more reduced capacity. As an economic loss, as a social loss, it is indeed an environmental loss. This is the River draining into the Bay. This is again a matter of food security. Death of coral reefs, meaning. Oops, what happened? Sorry about that. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, we have someone here from the Coral Triangle Initiative sitting in front of me. I was trying to make a point about, <coughs> sorry, you've seen the entire presentation by now. <laughs> I press the end button. Please bear with me. Or should I go back to? It's about fish catch. And in fact, the core triangle links Philippines with many other countries. There are six countries involved. And these coral reefs are all interconnected. Which means there's one debris not just in the Philippines. It extends beyond the borders of the Philippines. This is Agusan and Kumaika, two major rivers in Mindanao. Decrease in water discharge. 75% over the last 30 years. The major long-term effects of the loss of forest covers, therefore, decline in evenly distributed rainfalls, extended dry seasons up to five months in Luzon drying up of rivers and critical, which are critical for irrigation, portable water, and hydropower. So, when we already experienced 18% hunger, which is likely to increase to 26%, we added 30 million people in just 10 years. But Luzon can no longer feed itself. This is the question. And this is a pretty serious question. I would like to propose to you that there are reasons for optimism in our country. And there are many lands still available in the country, and many pristine environments still that can be conserved and preserved. And even though we don't normally refer to this place as a problem, it's not quite, in our opinion, it's really part of the solution. It's the Mindanao solution. And this is why, and I want to explain this to you briefly. 
population density, half of that of those only. Major food production centers of Busan, Davao, Putabato, and the heart of Mindanao, Okinawa. The foundation, in fact, is based in Mindanao. Our headquarters are there. And that's where a lot of the headwaters of Mindanao flow from. Look at this slide. That's the river system. Mindanao already contributes significantly to the food requirements of the country. These are some statistics. What Mindanao grows today. But it still has vast lands, arable lands, that can be developed. It contributes about 40% now of the food requirement. It is far below, below the potential it can reach. Given the kind of magnitude of food requirements we will have, we have now and we will have in the coming years. But we have to be realistic. Mindanao also has a lot of issues. And one of the key issues is poverty and conflict. And a lot of the lands that I spoke about are available in the deep south, in Muslim Mindanao. And the way to work there is to be culturally sensitive, as to careful, but yet be able to understand the kind of cultural patterns and traditions that exist in Mindanao among the Muslim communities. The parent company of Hiniluban has demonstrated that this can be done. And that's Unifruti. Unifruti went in to Sultan Kudara, Magindanao and the Northern Sur, and has thousands of hectares of plantations of bananas and pineapples today. Partnering with Lake Toto Paglas, of Tato Paglas, and others. And also partnering with some of the rebels and bringing them into the fold and having former MNLF and MLI people work on the farms. They set aside their arms and they work there. That's providing food on the table, economic opportunity, and therefore enabling environment for peaceful existence among various communities. It's not easy. It has been done. And today, that particular case of Paglas and Unifurity cooperation is studied by the World Bank Institute, presented at the National University of Singapore as a case study for replication elsewhere. That's another thing the foundation is involved in, to promote peace, equity, social justice, and sustainable development in Mindanao, including southern Mindanao. So, we must secure our watersheds all over the country, including the ones that are there, which are some of the remaining frontiers of pristine environments in the Philippines, in Mindanao. And that's the reason why we have to do it. For rain-fed agriculture, for irrigated agriculture, for drinking water, for power generation, of course, to respond to the threat of climate change to sequester the carbon. Therefore, we must invest in the protection and regeneration of forests. We call it reforestation. It's about reform, reforestation, and watershed conservation. In fact, this name came from Merrick Opasta. When I presented this to him, he said, why don't you call this reforestation? Because that's what it is. It's not just the effort. I know there are specific methodologies for this in Brazilian State University. And I'm still learning more about them. Uh, but we try to do our best to be able to emulate some of this work that they have done also.
before we go about reforesting or rainforesting, we must understand how we lost our forest. That's one big reason. Another reason is slash and burn agriculture. This is a major reason for loss of forest. It's the natural grass fires and Coben and Kalai are the two culprits. This slide shows my brother-in-law climbing up a mountain, which he actually could not move forward beyond this point because there was a deep ridge and they just couldn't negotiate that across. But this mountain, now New York, is barren. Here is a tree that used to exist up here. This tree is actually one tree with two branches like this, and these are two climbers. That's the size of the tree. Giant mossy forest tree, 35 feet diameter. This was the kind of forest that was there. This is the same from another angle. 1980, 2009. Here is the existing forest boundary, the tree line. This area is all burnt out. We call it the chimney effect. It burns from down below and catches up the ridge. And the reason this happens is because the indigenous people who are living there, they clear patches of forest for food crop. Then move on to new clearings. Every two to three years they do this. The old clearing is taken over by COVID or the light which later burns creating a chimney chimney effect. The smallest thing can ignite this thing. It's like timber in the dry season especially. This eventually catches fire and burning all the way up, step by step, engulfing the entire village. The hunters also gather game by burning, bringing in the game. The IP, as well as the migrants there, if they have also learn the same thing. Or they cut small trees for firewood of for them. Where do we start? And this is the program that we have recently developed in Hiluluma. As I mentioned, Bukitnon is the heart of Mandanao. It is the headwaters of major river systems for the island. This is the boundary of analysis. We are primarily focused in this area. There are four major coastal cities shown there. Four big seas, access to produce to the markets for export. Four major regions, and six key provinces. This is where we were. This slide shows a portion of Bukidnon and the Northern Sur, where those six major rivers flow from, comprising the river system of Mindanao. These are the consumption centers. Bukidnon and Lanao Sur, there are five, now six, we have broken down Wau and Kukuram, six mountain ranges. We work in all of these six mountain ranges and we have actually developed a program for equitable development, advancement of rural livelihoods. We call it the We have six birds to sell. 
We have many birds as well. You can buy. Buy black birds, white birds, whatever you like. Blue birds, pink birds. No, it's not just a marketing gimmick. It is the mountain ranges that comprise the remaining watersheds of Mindanao that actually are the key to the river systems that are now the waters that are still flowing in the river systems. This is the program that we have put together. We actually have come up through GIS technology and ground truthing of the communities who live in, the, in these mountain ranges. We have come up with 44,000 hectares that are denuded that need to be replanted. This figure is derived from the secondary forest, which is only 40 to 60 percent covered up, and the grasslands comprising the buffer zones. A lot of the IP and migrants are living in these buffer zones. They are the culprits who are actually burn the forest. So we have to work with them. 44,000 hectares is what we need to plant. By planting 44,000 hectares, we will actually save three times as much forest that exists there. The ratio is one to three. That is the impact of planting this much. A few words on the methodology. We've actually come up with Kalyandra. How many of you are familiar with Kalyandra? Kalyandra is like a tree. And I'll show you what it looks like. And it's indigenous. It's found here in Davao. That's the species we use for planting, intercropping with other larger indigenous trees. And I'll show you how that system works. And we work with the indigenous people who live there to provide them livelihood opportunities so that they can protect the forest. And we grow food for them as well as short, medium, and long-term livelihood opportunities from tree production. And we use, as I mentioned earlier, GIS technology for mapping the watersheds. This is our first planting 30 years ago in Kitanga. My office is in the foothills of Kitanga, just here. Still a very interesting environment. Kaliandra is like an ipilipa. You're familiar with ipilipa? A lot of foresters here. One by five and two by five meters. Intercropping. It's like a fern, but it blocks off any sunlight. The ferns go on top of each other like this. Which means that Kogan and Talai will not grow below, but they require sunlight to flourish. Is it the space with other trees? This is an example. Here are trees, pines, or acacia mansion, or la Lawan. This is Kalyandra. This is all Kalyandra seedlings. It grows wild. It can be used for a number of things. A lot of benefits. No weeds, less maintenance cost. It's leguminous, nitrogen fixation, less fertilizer. It acts as a good firewood and fodder. Ibees don't have to cut trees for firewood and can feed the animals as fodder. It has a lot of good qualities. We believe it's the only proven methodology that eliminates and the chimney of heaven. Here's Kalyandra. This is Kogan Talahi. It's blocked off. These are pines. 
There is another picture. Fine, Kaliandra. Kaliandra seedlings, there is no grass. This is a Kaliandra forest in Bukit Mama. Lawan trees alongside Kaliandra. And working with the IPs as I mentioned before. On short term, long term opportunities, food sufficiency, renewable source of firewood, and of course, value formation classes. We don't want them to just blow away their money from drinking alcohol. We need to teach them how to manage their cash as well when the cash comes in. It's really important. This is one of the datums that we are working with, and there are a number of them in the mountain ranges. This is basically the beneficiary model. One fourth hectare is for food production. Five three fourths hectare is for income opportunities. A typical six hectare each for each household. Abata, bamboo, various trees for short, medium, and long term production opportunities. This can also create downstream industry. This is the supply chain that you can link to. And it's starting to happen. This is the model we developed with the environmental science and social change. Father Walpole, Pedro, who's lived there in the mountains for the last 30 years. It's basically by elevation and by mountain range, by the kinds of IPs and their preference and the migrants who live there. What will grow at what elevation? And this color coding is then followed to cost this out. What the models will look like in terms of monetary returns. This is in pesos. Year three, model A, for instance, a thousand pesos. And you can have a windfall by year fourteen when you harvest the pines and the acacia mansion and the longer term trees. How does this happen in terms of GIS mapping? Here is Killing Glove. We've cordoned off the entire area where the tree line exists today. We have a buffer zone around it. Each ridge has a sample of killing blood alone, and we've done this for every mountain range. You've looked at, determined the watershed. Alongside each ridge, there are various plantations of Dole, Del Monte, Unifruti, Sumifru. There are cement plants, there are zip lines that use water from these ranges from this particular ridge, they can come and adopt a particular ridge to continue the supply of water. And in this case, there are eight ridges of Kitengla and a combined impact. This has been delineated very carefully. Per one, Kitengla project one, just by way of example, that's where it is. That particular ridge, 1,567 hectares. That needs to be planted. This is how the GIS, that's how powerful the GIS technology is today. We can actually zoom in and have a very clear idea of where the denudation is. And then we've gone in and drowned through the communities who live there and counted them, the people that we need to work with. How many households are there to bring them as partners in the program for reforestation or reforestation. So in this particular case, prospect for replanting is 1,567. 
this is the beneficiary planting, meaning which is which has returns, commercial returns. We can harvest. This is permanent. In this particular case, permanent watershed is far more, which needs to remain there to protect the rest of the one to three ratio that I showed you earlier. This particular sample. That's how much it's going to cost for beneficiary planting for permanent watershed. We need $2.7 million to plant that much. Beneficiary and permanent. On average, it will cost $1,744. I'm told by my forester friends that that's a pretty good average cost. Average cost per hectare. However, if you take into account the total area it will protect, the total forest cost for replanting is only $600. In some way, what we could see this as an economic cost. In other words, the cost is far lower than the actual financial cost for planting this much, if you take into account the total forest area protected. As a result, of planting the denuded areas today. This is the entire pearls, six pearls. Beneficiary planting and permanent planting. In fact, taking that as the example I gave you, that specific bridge had more permanent planting, but overall, again, it shows up highly permanent planting because of the denudation that has occurred in Kittinglar. By the way, Kittinglar is the uppermost mountain range. It is one of the most pristine environments that needs to be protected. And I'll show you why it is so important. It is, in fact, the sole source of water of Kagayan, the Oro, and six municipalities in Bukitnam, including what I would like, the capital. 44,000 hectares, total number of beneficiaries, 3,887. Families, households, you can multiply that by six or seven. There are big families down there. That's a lot of people. Nearly 25 to 30,000 people. The six ranges over the next 10 to 15 years will cost $87 million to plant, to replant. And these are the average costs. They range between 400 and 600, close to 650, in the case of Wao Mumaran, which is the now Sioux. By the way, Mumaran is the uh, watershed of Lake Lanao. It's very prestigious and very pristine. Prioritization. Pearls 1 and 2 are high priority. These are prioritized 1, 2, 3 on the basis of various things that I note here. I mean, we have felt that the governorship of Okinawa is really very committed to reforestation programs, environmental conservation programs. In this case, the Dubines. We work very closely with the governor, governor's office, the vice governor. Joseph Berry is now the vice governor. Uh, Alex Kalingasan is the governor now. But Joe has been around for a long time. The senators, the congressmen, we have presented the program to all of them. We've actually got a resolution by the Sanginian Pandalavigan. Did I pronounce that correctly? Sanginian. Uh, the SP, the provincial board, passing a resolution for the PERF. And they have written to people in Manila the central government, the departments of national resources and environmental national resources, and NEDA and DOF and DDM. Maximize the impact, that one to three ratio that I talked about. Scientific knowledge, the GIS. Yeah, the state of watersheds, Kittiglar being the most denuded of all. And obviously the whole potential for partnerships. We're actually looking at a program from Ayibina, my former employer, who want to come in and help bring it out. 
to reforest some of its uh, lands in uh, Bukit Non, Lanasu, and other areas. As I mentioned before, Pur 1 and 2 are top priority because of these reasons. Sole source of water supply to Kagayan Bureau from Kitangla. If Kitangla goes, people will be very thirsty in Kagayan Bureau. And six municipalities, seven municipalities, I'm sorry. Uh, Pulangi Dam, Kitangla again is the major source. Lake Malawa, I just mentioned. Food production. <coughs> Again, the waters flow down for irrigation, particularly in some of the southern Mindanao areas. Ecological significance, biodiversity. Uh, we also partner with the Philippine Eagle Foundation. We have a Philippine Eagle by the name of Inaduma. That we brought up ourselves and we released it to the wild. I won't give you the details on financial and economic analysis, but suffice to say that the financial analysis shows that 15 years, 5% only, 20 years, 8%. Internal rate of return. Payback period is 10 years. Net present values look quite good, although they become negative when it comes to total watershed because there's no commercial benefits from it. Number of beneficiaries is 23,000, conservatively taking around six people per family. Economic analysis shows that the program is very robust. Beneficiary planting is 32% in general. But total watershed, it is nearly 22%. This is a with and without program scenario. If you had the program, you would have the abaca and the bamboo and the Caribbean Pine and the Acacia Mansion and the Wan. These are the benefits for the people who live there and the saleability of these products. If you didn't have this, what would be the scenario? Well, they won't have this. So we take the net cash flow based on the with and without programs. And that's the economic analysis. So in economic terms, this program is very, very attractive, particularly for those who are interested in environmental conservation, donor programs from the ADB, the World Bank, the Agence Française de Développement, the French Development Agency, are very interested to partner with us. We are also talking to the German technical agency, GTZ. We're talking to the private sector, of course, but they're interested more on the financial side. They want a, a return for their buck. Some additional benefits of reforestation are, of course, carbon sequestration. So basically, an average family of five, 39 tons of carbon dioxide emissions per year, you need to plant 0.78 hectares to neutralize your carbon footprint. You can calculate your own carbon footprint and tell us that we'll plant the tree for you. 1,000 hectares can sequester 50,000 tons of carbon. The role of forest and climate change mitigation. Carbon six, forests are carbon six. They conserve stored carbon in forests, enhance carbon storage in forests and their products, substitute wood, wood for, for fossil fuels, like the Kalina. As carbon sources, the conversion of forest to non forest land use or deforestation. Change in canopy or structure can lead to degradation. This is red. Is anyone familiar with red? Red is a thing <coughs> of the day. The Philippines is just signed on to the Cancun Agreement. Red is on for the Philippines. These are some just some benefits emanating from red. It's a mechanism to pay for environmental services, essentially. We have just actually issued a red strategy for the country. And those are the benefits of 
the right strategy. Reduce degradation, deforestation, poverty alleviation, biodiversity, and coastal governance. This particular program for equitable advance of rural livelihoods of poor links very well with the red strategy of the Philippines. So we have to draw down some funding sources for that also through climate change funds and red funds. And these are just some reasons why, or explanation how it links to the red strategy. It is heavily focused on community-based natural resources management, social livelihood improvement, biodiversity conservation. Of course, it has very strong intersectoral coordination. Hinduban has, has been asked to be the lead coordinator of the Secretariat for watershed conservation in Bukitnon. And we work very closely with the Bukitnon Watershed Protection and Development Council that's based in Malalai, as well as the province of Bukitnon. So hopefully we'll have a chance to work very closely with the folks like DNR and other departments that are working in Bukitnon as a secondary. We believe that we have proven methodology. We have effective approaches, particularly for social library programs for IPs. We are very active in the Council for Warships in Bukitnon. We have very strong support from local government, as I mentioned to you. A resolution has now been issued and sent to the national government. And we are continuing to get and find more and more uh, financial and technical support from our partners. The group has been around for 35 years, including now almost 17 years in the autonomous region of Muslim We've been in reforestation and rehabilitation of degraded lands, as well as mining projects for the last 20 years. We work in five pilot communities. We have now 100 hectares of bamboo, giant bamboo. 30 hectares of Arabica coffee. Starbucks wants to buy our coffee. Nestle is also talking to us now. Although they make robusta. They want robusta. But we do Arabica, but we will be doing, I think, in the near future, robusta. Also. We have 180 IP family beneficiaries. And we like to say that they have improved their health and their nutrition with, from what we have done with them done working with them in the forest, mountain ranges. We have good community relations. And we are going, growing organic veggies now. 150 families in Manila get our veggies from Bukinon. These are fresh, organic. If you want to place an order, you can go to a site called My Personal Farm. That is a sister organization of Hindu. My Personal Farm Thank you very much, Prof. Ali. Now uh, it's time for the open forum. We invite our audience to use the microphones around the room for your questions or comments for Professor Mani. If you need to, by the way, if you need to take a closer look at this presentation, Professor Malik is willing to uh, upload a PDF um, copy of his PowerPoint presentation in the CIRCA website. It will be available by Thursday. Yes, Dr. Mauricio. Uh, thank you, Professor Malik, for your uh, very interesting discussion of uh, uh, rainforestation in uh, Mineral. I, well, I feel sorry because I helped destroy some of your forests in Bolivia when I was in the city of and another. <laughs> and uh, I, because of this, I would like to make some suggestions. Please improve your reforestation system. That is all. You ought to have new systems like do not uh, use only one species in the same area. 
this will not help you mitigate climate change. What is probably better would be uh, in the uplands and in the uh, long time uh, deforested, deforested areas, just now your fast growing species. Only one species but planted at various periods so that you will have several canopies. And then, like what I did in Nagusansur, uh, in our Nagusansur farms, tree farms, plant bananas and because this vegetation is almost 100% water, water, they will now serve as your reservoir. They get the water, well, your various canopies, the canopies uh, will, uh, will fill, will uh, hold most of the water during rainfall. The what falls to the ground will now be taken by the abaca and the bananas. You do not need a reservoir. That this should be your reservoir. The problem now is how many bananas, how many avocas should be uh, planted around each tree. Because uh, the fast growing species will provide uh, materials for factories, which will provide uh, jobs for uh, your uh, inhabitants. This could be for uh, paper, paper manufacturing, for Lawani, uh, as we did in Pacific number, where we employed thousands of people. In, so that instead of they destroying the forest, they help, prep, <laughs> they help us maintain by uh, using what, uh, doing some timber start improvement, rep, uh, enrichment planting, and so forth and so on, plant and uh, maintenance of this forest so that uh, the fast growing species will grow very fast. But you have you can now use the micro bump and micro growth from uh, here from your building because these uh, are uh, fertilizers um, microbes so that when you introduce this to the ground around the trees, the microbes will wake up and they will uh, encourage the natural, the magnetic microbes there to uh, embrace the soil. Again, I would like now to uh, second the motion your planting of bamboos. But you can plant now the bamboos using now the salt, the salt system of uh, Mindanao. Uh, you can plant bamboos as well as uh, forest trees and then Again, as I said, you use now this, uh, this uh, 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 bananas and mali and abaca because the bananas will provide food, the abaca will provide the livelihood, and then the, the, the waste from this will now be used for mushroom production. After the mushroom production, you will now feed this from the earthworm. You have now the, the, uh, the African uh, night crawler which now will provide you the natural fertilizer, the best fertilizer over ever. And then, uh, I suggest also that what like in the Nagusan, in Nagusan Sur, when I was with the Wayne well Industrial now, in my second company, we compartmentalized the Siano Creeks that are uh, tributary to the Nagusan River. Uh, this uh, will, will prevent uh, so much water uh, from the mountain going into the Agusan River, and then they can, you can raise there some uh, fish products so that if your uh, compartment, compartmentalized is well done, uh, you lift the door in the lower uh, uh, compartment uh, side, then you just pick the fish <laughs> rather than. Uh, Spend the hours and days in lining the piece because the piece will be wiser than the <laughs> complainer. Well, here yeah, you remove the water, you pick yeah. the piece, you pick only the large ones, and then you can uh, invite us for your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. No, thank you for that. No, sir, if you are feeling guilty about contributing to the deforestation, you can give us some money if we plan <laughs> back to you. By the way, you know, I grew up in Pakistan, 
in the southern city of Karachi. Uh, and there used to be a river that used to flow close to my house. And whenever it would drain, the river would overflow. And guess what would be on the road? Fish. But it's no longer there. I'm sure Pasig used to be the same way someday, long ago. So yes, uh, reflecting back on the changes, lots to be done to go back to where we were, at least try to go back to close to where we were by the conservation efforts. But thank you very much for those tips. <laughs> Dr. Mauricio is a retired forest, uh, forestry professor, so he has a lot of uh, suggestions. There's 27 years in the logging industry, so... Uh, <laughs> now, uh, one thing I would like to suggest, I, uh, I remember now, is to plant uh, fruit trees, like Blancones, uh, uh, Durian, because here, uh, you can now, uh, aside from the, the giving you food, this will now be, uh, this will encourage the wild animals to come. So you will have the deer, you will have the wild pigs, you will have the wild pan chicken, you will have the monkey, you will have the birds. So you have five. If you cannot, if you still get hungry, I do not know. No, wildlife has a lot to do with the forest as well. And we have lost the Philippine eagle largely, but we are trying to reintroduce. But in our backyard, the photograph I showed you, there's now a wild deer. And I didn't know how the deer sounds. It sounds like a wild dog. It might. Yeah, it howls. Really amazing. Well, it only came back after the forest came. It came down the mountain. And it resides there. There's two, three families now. Oh dear. Any other questions or uh, yes, remarks, Mr. Or comments, critique? My name is Dr. Samsuri Vasa. I'm Jaka Skola. I'm PhD in animal science and my, my, my minor in black life. I just want to ask you actually. If we use, uh, actually, the, if we talk about the reforestation, I think that is the, the top, really, it's a tree plantation of the reforestation. Uh, the one that really we need to concern about the tree plantation is the wildlife condition. Because if uh, we only plant one type of the uh, tree, it will be affected to the wildlife condition because they will not come back. But I'm really, uh, really surprised when you say that already wild deer come back. And if you're asking the something like the wolf, Yes, sir. That is the Philippine deer. They have the sorting like that. Yeah. So my special lesson is in deer. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Behavior, behavior reproduction of deer. So they will sorting like that if uh, if it is coming to the season of breeding. Is it not? Uh, absolutely. Yes, sir. Uh, actually, my question: Did you have the next program about the how you can give it back the wildlife to your forest? Because if we talk about the reforestation, it's really a meaningful if you can not only about the emission CO2 uh, mitigation of the climate change spread, but uh, more over in the wildlife. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Well, thank you. So, our hope is that we can do both. We can sequester the carbon and also have the wildlife. But we don't have a particular program except for partnering with Philippine Eagle Foundation. And we raise a bird in captivity. I mean, we actually raised it till it was big enough. Then we released it into the wild. There were two birds released. In fact, one died. Couldn't hang it. Um, and actually, I was reminded of my uh, course that I took in wildlife ecology back at the University of Wisconsin when the California condor was introduced. And I had a professor from Cornell who had come to Wisconsin to tell us about his story and how he went about reintroducing uh, the California, uh, the California condor. It was also lost. And he emulated in some of the things that he did way back. That, this is about 20 years ago when I was in college, more than 30 years ago. And we were able to do at least with one bird successfully. But other wildlife, I mean, I'm not a wildlife specialist. I don't even know what all is there 
all I can tell by looking at the birds just in our farm with the trees that have come up and the mountain ranges when I walk through the communities, there's a lot of wildlife there. There's a lot of bird life there. And I think, obviously, forests are the habitat. They are the same thing. They are where they are, these wildlife live. So if you take away the forest, there is no habitat left ready for that. And of course, the water is gone and oxide also. But no, I would love to see in our partnerships, wildlife ecologists and wildlife NGOs working in Mindanao to come and partner with us and see how we can do it together. But thank you for that. We have time for two more questions. Yes, Dr. America. I am with America and I am a retired cinematologist. Uh, you have not given us uh, uh, some uh, indication of how many staff do you have. And out of the staff you have, have been uh, for uh, part number one, how many sociologists are there? How many? So, social scientists or so, social workers are there? We now have 15 people working full time or part time with the foundation. Uh, part time because they are affiliates from Unifruti. Meaning they are affiliates of the foundation, but they are really staff of Unifruti and they are working with me as well when I need them. But Unifruti is a parent organization, as I mentioned to you, of the foundation that employs 7,000 people. So they are agronomists, they are soil scientists, they are, so they are sociologists, they are anthropologists there. All kinds of researchers work for Unifruti, but myself as the chair, I'm able to tap on any or anybody, everybody, if I want, the kinds of expertise I want from the parent organization, which is private sector. They are the main funding source for the foundation. They are the ones who are funding my staff, uh, who are working directly with me full time. Um, I don't have a full-time sociologist. There are sociologists working in Unifruti because they are working with, I don't know if you know Paglas Corporation, in Dr. Paglas Sultan Kudara. We need sociologists there because there are a lot of tissues there with the former Amaya but and so on. But I may say that uh, in the coming weeks, we are actually going to be bidding for some projects donor funded and those projects require sociologists so the foundation will go out and then bring in as consultants to work on those projects if you win them uh, sociologists as well anthropologists perhaps also now the 87 million dollars over 10 to 15 years is going to be a lot more people we now have 180 nearly 200 actually IP communities uh, working with us, they are like our partners. And the foundation works with the environmental science for social change very closely. We draw on the expertise of ESSC. ESSC is very well known and they have been established for many, many years. Uh, it's led by a Jesuit priest, Father Walpole, who is a professor at the NEO. So we can leverage more resources, people from other partner agencies. Um, that's how we are working on, of course, the departments there. Kittigar itself is 23,000 hectares to be planted. It's one of the largest. No. Uh, 13,000, sorry, 13,000. 13,000 hectares just in Kittigar. So obviously that will require a lot more IP communities to work with. And once the program gets fully funded, we will have the resources to employ or deploy more people. And we are ready to do that. Including the ones that we need to draw down from Unifruti. They will come. So personally I feel quite confident that we will have the human resources once we get fully funded for 
the Katangar, or even the parts of the ridges that I showed you, the eight ridges in Katangar alone. Right? That's for a local one that's dropped by one. Last question. Any more questions from the audience, from our undergraduate or graduate students? Yeah, given that uh, the area is maybe uh, belong to a Kati area, so what's the the role of uh, the IP communities in in your program as as uh, as partner? Yeah. Are they as guardians? Are they employed? Are they employed or do they get the benefits uh, after after the maturity of the trees? And, uh, or... Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Lope, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, Lope is behind the connection once again to reignite my connection with Mercy from Sirka also. Um, yes, these are Karti and Kartsi lands. They are all ancestral domains. Uh, our role has been to provide the certification and titling where needed to the indigenous people. And they work principally as our partners. We provide free seedlings to them for whether it's uh, abaca or their uh, vegetables. The deal is that they will not cut the forest and they will become guardians of the forest. And that we will share the benefits of the commercial plantings that will be there and provide the access for their produce, access produce, to the market, provide access to the market of their produce, the access, like coffee for example. We do grow Arabica with some of the IP communities. So basically we share the profits and that whatever we get from them, we plow back in for buying more seedlings for them to plant further for the next season. So that's how the model works. We are a social enterprise, we are non-profit. We just meet our costs. Just one question, because I heard the word titling. Yeah. Is it land titles you're talking about, or what's the kind of titling? These are government properties. These right? are these are ancestral domains. Okay. So Karti is a title. Karsi is a certificate. Most of the ancestral domains are cooperatives. They are. are comprising of various communities living together in a cooperative. It's normally on a certificate basis for that, for these ancestral communities. And they cannot use that for like, you know, uh, uh, accessing credit for loans? They can. They can act as, it can act as a collateral as well. Okay. If it's a title, isn't it so? If it's a title, it can be used for collateral. Or does it have to be no, it's a uh, community land. Mm -hmm. Ancestral domain. It's a yeah. uh, certificate of ancestral title. So that's Kalti. Mm -hmm. There's another one, uh, they call it Kalti. Certificate Kalti. of uh, ancestral land title, which is titled to individual. Uh, but still, it's part of the Kalti and cannot be used as collateral. As, as a cooperative, can they use it as a collateral? As an organization, as a, as a, cooperative. As a, as a tribe. Yeah. They can engage in investment, but as not, not as collateral. Uh -huh. the price, they, they can take their terms, the investor can come in to the assessor domain, but they, they are the one dictating. Yeah. Through the process they call the pre informed consent. Yeah. So it's usually uh, there are consultations and approval with the tribal yeah. But her question was about collateral. They cannot be. They cannot use it as a collateral against microfinance borrowings. So, I I will go by what Lope is saying. I do know that they do dictate their terms, and it is an issue, particularly in Muslim and also, mm -hmm. on these ancestral domains. Because if they do, then we really need not subsidize them fully. They could really engage in. You know, yeah, if they can be used as collateral. Yeah, that's very true. Maybe this is one of the limitations. Yeah, in fact, in, in uh, some county areas where there are uh, private sector investment, 
the IPs actually receive royalties, particularly in mining operations. So they get income uh, out of the <coughs> title. Yeah. Some of the work that the foundation does clearly could do with microfinance. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, even this rainforestation work we do can benefit a lot, and especially when it comes to downstream industry. Once the abaca is grown and the bamboo is grown, it has to find its way to the market to manufacture something. And small and medium scale industries could really benefit from microfinance as well. As well as some of the ancestral domains that are there with this IP. Perhaps there could be some way of building a royalty system into it so that they have some kind of a way to sustain the microfinance opportunities that are available to them. Did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. So the idea is that maybe as a student at UPOU, uh, you said they are curious about that, uh, that about that IP that uh, they cannot uh, they cannot uh, the sangla in the land, right? But in your in your, your organization, in lab, in lab, do they value? Are you an NGO or or are you a uh, uh, your organization is uh, investor in that area. How do you hold your organization? No, thank you for that. As I mentioned to you, we are a social enterprise. And the definition of a social enterprise is that it's like Dawat Kalinga to some extent. What? Dawat Kalinga. Dawat Kalinga. Dawat Somewhat like that because our idea is to develop models that can be replicated. Mm -hmm. And we have the model for rainforestation. And another important de definition of a social enterprise is that it can <coughs> scale up, not just replicate here and there, different places, the model, but it can also scale up and sustain itself. It doesn't live on charity or donations. It can sustain financially itself. So we are a social enterprise focused on our efforts in conservation of the environment, in this case forests and watersheds, on rural development as I mentioned, and on environmental advocacy. And seminars like this that I present um, wherever I possibly can to students and academia and so on. So we are partners with the communities. We are partners with the provincial government. We are also implementers of certain programs for the provincial government. We are now being asked as a secretary or a lead coordinator of the secretary on watersheds in Bukitama. Uh, so that's that's the role we play. We are not a private company. We're not an investor, sir. No, we're not an investor. 